All right. Well, welcome. I'm. Uh, it's it's hard. I just have to tell you all this. Uh, for anybody who happens to be tuning in on the Facebook Live, it really gets difficult to speak to an empty room. And, uh, you know, just look out here. I try to make eye contact with people, and there's nobody here. And so uh, I wish y'all would show up on Wednesday night and Sunday night. I really do. I re it would make it a lot easier on me uh, to, to keep my train of thought together. Um, but uh, anyway, we're going to go ahead and... I'm going to take some prayer requests from the people who aren't here, and uh, so we'll add to our prayer list tonight. It's good to uh, see you, even though I can't see you since nobody's here. Uh, it's good to, to connect with you online, and um, if you do have prayer requests and you're watching on the live stream, you can always send an email in, or you can go to our website, berlinchurchsc.org, and you can go to the prayer wall and just click on that graphic. When the prayer comes across, just hit, hit that graphic and it'll take you directly to this little mechanism where you can fill in a prayer request and put your name, and if you want it to be unspoken or anonymous, you can do that as well. But that comes straight to me, and that helps me uh, keep the prayer list up to date. So um, there are a couple of updates I'll share with you on the prayer list that, that got added last week. Um, they're near the top, the Mongold family. Efra Johnson told me about this one, um, a little baby boy named Dylan, born to that family on April 22nd. And they knew ahead of time, the doctors told them that there, was, uh, there were complications and that most likely when the child was born, he wouldn't survive. Uh, like he, was, he was safe when he was not born yet, but as soon as he was born, he would most likely die, and that's what happened. And so, but they wanted to go ahead and, and go through the process and and so uh, he, he did pass away just moments after he was born on April 22nd. So just be in prayer for that family. And uh, also right below that, uh, one of Darlene's co-workers, uh, Ashley, her husband, Chris Vaughn, was just diagnosed with thyroid cancer and is uh, beginning, getting ready to begin treatment, I believe. I don't think he has yet, but if you could be in prayer for them, especially him. And uh, then right below that, um, one of Amy Field's co-workers, um, her granddaughter, uh, Ellie Bridges Finley, is the, that's the baby's name. She's two weeks old, and let me explain what that is. And this is ironic because this is exactly the same thing that my Elizabeth had uh, when she was born. And so that VSD s stands for ventricular septal defect. It's a basically it's a hole in the heart, but that identifies where it is. And so uh, she, this, this little baby girl's got the same exact thing. And so it produces a pretty pronounced heart murmur. And uh, so I was able to share with Amy to share with her coworker, which was really helpful. Hey, Elizabeth's about to turn 20 years old and you know, she's been seeing a cardiologist since, since the day she was born, but she's doing great. You know, she had one little procedure back when she was about four or five years old, and they did a, a like a heart cath type of procedure down at Charleston, and uh, hers, she had, she had like a, the main hole in the heart and then a bunch of little tiny holes around that one, and they were able to go in through the cath and repair a lot of that, and uh, so since then... She's been doing great. So that was, that was a, a nice way to, to be able to encourage that family that, hey, things can be just fine. You know, she might not have to have surgery. They've been telling us that for 20 years that, well, maybe she might have to have surgery, but so far she's doing great. So uh, just be in prayer for the Finley uh, family there because at first, you know, they're a little nervous because they don't know what to expect from that type of news. So just be in prayer for them. And then, let's see, Becky Brown's father has begun the radiation treatment that he's going to be doing four weeks, five days a week. And then I've updated Annabeth Rogers about her diagnosis from Hodgkin's lymphoma, and she did start her chemo on Monday, and it is making her, uh, it started out good, and then she was having some, some adverse reactions, and so she was admitted to the hospital just to, to be monitored. Uh, so praying that that's going to be going uh, begin to go better for them. 
let's see here. Make sure I don't have any other uh, additions. Okay. Yeah, I think that's all the, the ones that we added since last week. So, uh, anyone have any other requests we need to add or any updates? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh oh. Yeah. So that's is that considered congestive heart failure? Is that or is it just Okay. 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 Oh yeah. Okay. Okay. Okay, Peggy Douglas. Okay. Okay. And she's at Aiken or she at Lexington? Lexington. Okay. All right. Anyone else? Milton. Okay. Okay. Milton. All right. Who else? Yes, ma'am. Is she at Aiken? Lexington? Okay. All right. Doris Gleaton. All right, who else? Joan, that's on Monday, right? Yeah, that's right, Joan. Okay. Joan Walling. Heart cath on Monday. Okay. What else? Yep, I got that on there. Okay. Uh, I have not heard. I I don't I don't have any updates on Blake Scott. He was the uh, the teenage boy who fell and had a back injury. I don't have, I've not heard any updates on that. Anybody? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. And it's been, that's been a, a two or three weeks, and I'm, I'm, I can't remember now, honestly, I can't remember who mentioned that to put it on the list, but, uh, but no, I haven't got any update. Okay. Oh, really? Okay. Right. Okay. 
So an additional treatment to your eye. That's Willie uh, on Monday. Mm -hmm. Good grief. That's a lot, a lot to keep up with. Three different kinds of drops, all different quantities. Gracious. Well, hopefully the, the procedure on Monday will go well. Good gracious. <laughs> well, I hope so. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, if you're going to be driving, I hope you can see well. I hope you can see well enough to do that. <laughs> oh, my. That keep your reflexes uh, sharp. That's right. That's good. All right, any other prayer requests? Yes, sir. He did? Okay. Okay. Seth Fulmer, home from the hospital. Yes. Okay. Let's see. Definitely continue to pray for him. Okay. Anyone else? Yes. Okay. Okay, good. Yeah. So she's she's not on the vent right now, but she's Okay, and where is she? Okay. Okay. All right. So, but she's not on the ventilator, which is good. That's, okay. Good. All right. Anyone else before we pray? Okay. Well, let's take take these to the Lord then. This is this is a lot of lot of updates and a lot of prayers that are needed, and uh, we'll do that, and then we'll spend a little time in Bible study. Father, we thank you tonight for bringing us here. We thank you for allowing us to gather uh, gather in person, gather online, and discuss the prayer needs that we have and to lift each other up encourage each other and i pray that we'll do that i pray that we'll take advantage of this this gift and blessing we have uh, to fellowship and also to pray for each other and how that that prayer time really is a benefit to us uh, even when we're praying for other people when we're uh, in prayer you know we we say this every week lord we we're not giving you information you don't have. We're sharing concerns with one another. But when we pray to you, that's a benefit for us that uh, you're changing our, our hearts. You're working on us. You're helping us to become more and more like Jesus. You're shifting our agenda onto your agenda and, and doing a work in our hearts and lives. And so, Lord, I pray that you would prompt all of us to have the motivation to take advantage of that and to spend more time in prayer, spend more time in your word and uh, basically just uh, in community with you and how that will help us and change our hearts and change our lives for the better. And so, Lord, as we're here together tonight, I just uh, lift up all these needs to you. There's a lot of folks dealing with a lot of issues. We praise you for the, the good news that we've heard in, in many cases of uh, people coming home from the hospital or people doing better, um, having good news. But at the same time, there's so many that we've added on here that are still uh, in great need and still having severe struggles medically, physically, but also uh, emotionally. And, and there's a lot of other 
issues that are kind of behind the scenes that maybe we don't even know about. So, Lord, I pray that for each one of these people on our prayer list, each one that has been mentioned tonight, I pray that you would make yourself known in these circumstances, that folks would have a sense of your presence, that they would even sense that they have people praying for them, and how much of an encouragement that can be, to know that there's people gathered up at a church building, and they're lifting them up right now in prayer, lifting them up to you, and and praying, interceding on their behalf that you would work in their circumstances. And Lord, we know that you are at work, and we know you're the only source of hope we have in in any of these situations. That's why we pray to you. That's why we don't just sit and grovel and and just have a pity party and think, well, nothing can be done. We know that you can do anything, and nothing is too impossible or challenging for you. And so we bring our needs to you knowing that. And, Lord, we're confident that you hear our prayers. We're confident in who you are, in your abilities. But we also know that you have that perfect knowledge that we don't have and that you know what's best in every situation. So we trust you in that way. We trust you with these needs, knowing that uh, even if you work in a way that we kind of scratch our heads and wonder what's going on, we know we can trust you, and we know you, you know what's going on, and you know what you're doing, and you have things firmly in control. So, Lord, I pray that as we lift all these needs up to you, that you'd use that to strengthen our faith, help us to build more and more trust in you, and, and just let that, let that be, and, and know that when we've given these things over to you, we don't have to worry anymore. We know you, that you're, you're at work, and that's enough. So, Lord, help us to remember that uh, even as we pray tonight. And, Lord, I pray also that you would bless our time of Bible studies. We open your word and seek to learn more about you and then uh, apply these things into our lives that we might live in a way that better represents you and represents that we are your children and that uh, we serve you, we love you, you love us, and we're trying to share that with the world around us. So, Lord, we need, in all these things, we need your help, your strength, and your influence in our lives. So, Lord, we just lift them up to you. We trust you for our needs. We praise you for the answered prayers. And we expect that you're going to speak to us through your word tonight. So we want to say thank you, Lord. We want to always be thankful for everything you do, everything you will do. And so we lift all these prayers to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, tonight we're going to look uh, in a place very similar to where we were on Sunday night. We're going to be in the, in the Psalms tonight. So if you'd open your Bible to Psalm 145. 145. I was considering where to be tonight in, in the Bible, and you know, Sunday we were Sunday morning, we were in the third chapter of Ruth, and the theme there was about counting on God's goodness. You know, Ruth and Naomi and their lives and their predicament, they could count on God uh, to be faithful and to be good and uh, provide, and so. That kind of sent me here. That sent me to this psalm because Psalm 145 is, a, is an interesting psalm. I'll tell you a couple little interesting things about it before we read it and talk about it for just a few minutes. Uh, this is the last psalm in the book of Psalms that is attributed to David. Now he he uh, was inspired to write many of them, but this is the last one out of the 150 that is attributed to him. And this is also... Uh, an alphabetical uh, acrostic. Let me tell you what that means. So the, the most uh, famous one, I guess, uh, that's the wrong word to use, but uh, you get my meaning, is Psalm 119. Because Psalm 119 is the longest one. It's 176 verses, but it is broken up into 22 sections of eight verses each. And each one uh, corresponds with a letter in the Hebrew alphabet. Well, this psalm 
is also done that way uh, with the Hebrew alphabet. But there's one letter, the letter N, noon, the Hebrew letter noon is missing. And so right along in verse between verse 13 and 14, uh, some translations, the, the original Hebrew text does not contain this two little lines. But uh, some of your translations, depending on what you have in front of you, may include an extra little phrase there between verse 13 and 14. So I just want to make you aware of that. And, and we'll, when we get to it, I'll, I'll let you know what it is. Uh, but this psalm is organized because there's 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. There's 21 verses in this psalm. So it kind of follows that order. If you were to look in the Hebrew Bible, that's what it would look like. So anyway, just, just a few little facts about this psalm. But here's what's interesting about it. You know, I was mentioning about Sunday, we were talking about uh, the goodness of God, counting on the goodness of God. And so this psalm is all about the glory of God. It's about giving praise to him because he's good, because he's faithful, because he's the king. And so this is not your typical uh, Bible study or, or message where sometimes, you know, you can kind of go verse by verse and say, well, here's point one, here's point two, here's point three, here's what we should do. You know, it's not really arranged that way because it's in the Psalms and it's written in a different, it's almost like poetry. You know, it's very similar. So you have to kind of treat it differently. So I want to read it and then just kind of go through a few points so we can see uh, what David was inspired to write and why and then how that affects us, how that can inform us uh, in what we're supposed to be doing as far as how we respond to who God is. So let's read it, Psalm 145, starting in verse 1. Here's what the Bible says. I will extol you, my God, O King, and I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you, and I will praise your name forever and ever great is the lord and highly to be praised and his greatness is unsearchable one generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wonderful works i will meditate men shall speak of the power of your awesome acts and i will tell of your greatness they shall eagerly Utter the memory of your abundant goodness and will shout joyfully of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and great in loving kindness. The Lord is good to all and his mercies are over all his works. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and your godly ones shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and talk of your power to make known to the sons of men your mighty acts and the glory of the majesty of your kingdom because your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. Now right there, some of your translations may add as part of verse 13, the Lord is faithful in all his words and gracious in all his deeds. Okay, but that, that's the piece that's not in the original Hebrew text. Okay, then verse 14. The Lord sustains all who fall and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you and you give them their food in due time. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his deeds. The Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of those who fear him. He will also hear their cry and will save them. The Lord keeps all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord. And all flesh will bless his holy name forever and ever. Now that, when you read that, I mean, it's like, a, it's like the introduction of a worship service, you know? Because he's just going through over and over uh, 
who God is, what's he like, and how do we respond to it? Uh, what kind of characteristics does he have? Uh, and, and that's why I say, what's he like? And then, how does David respond to that? How does, how does, how does that, when he hears the description of God, how does it make him feel? And how, how does he feel like, what does he feel like he needs to do as a reaction to that? Okay, so when we look through this, it's kind of separated into to a few little sections. Like I said, it's, it's an alphabet of praise. It's like uh, one commentator called it the ABCs of the glory of God because it's following the Hebrew alphabet letter by letter. And so David starts off with this opening doxology. So when you look at the first two verses... He's talking about himself. He's talking about what he's going to do as far as, you know, I don't know what anybody else is going to do, but here's, I'm going to praise the Lord, and this is what that looks like. He says, I will extol you, and that's why. He calls him my God and King. Then he says, I'll bless your name forever and ever. And if that were not enough, then he says, every day I'll bless you. I'll praise your name forever and ever. So, that's an introduction, the first two verses. So, so what, does that, what does that do for us? How does that apply to us? Is there anything in our lives that would cause us to say, you know what, I need to praise the Lord every single day. Every day I need to bless His name. Because is there anything that we have been given or blessings we've received or a life we live or, or, or maybe things we've been spared from that we can say every single day, God deserves my praise and my worship. That's, what, that's how David is feeling when he's approaching this psalm and the Spirit's inspiring him to write these words down. He's, he's, he's almost, he's almost, you can sense that he's almost overcome with, I don't know how to express, but I just know I need to, to praise God every single day. He, he's worth that. He, the way he's uh, dealt with me in my life. He said, I'll praise your name forever and ever. So then the theme gets more developed when you get to verse 3. You start seeing the description and, and the adjectives and these characteristics of who God is. So if you look at verse 3, he's great. Great is the Lord. He's greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. Each verse, as it follows this alphabetical method, it's like each verse just tells you something else. You may already know it. Maybe you've experienced it in your own life, but yet it's a, it's a pleasant reminder to say, it's almost like you can read it and you can picture yourself saying, Amen. You know, great, the Lord is great. You know, I agree with that. He is highly to be praised. He is, uh, his greatness is unsearchable. And then David continues with how we'll, t we'll talk to each other about it. You look at verse 4. What do we have to do? I love this part right here. What do we have to do to make sure our kids and their kids and their kids know about this God that we, that we serve? Don't, we got to tell them, right? We have to pass this on. In fact, some have said that the Christian faith is never more than one generation from extinction. Because if, if this generation does not pass the baton and share the gospel and teach a generation of children what they should know and how to live according to Scripture and who God is and why He's worthy of praise and why we have all the things we have and look around at creation and know God did that. If we don't share those things with our children... How are they going to know? They're not just going to pick it up by accident. That's, as a parent, that is a responsibility to pass that on to the next generation. So look at verse 4. One generation shall praise your works to another and declare your mighty acts. So verse 4 speaks directly to passing on who God is. You know, it's not enough to just, well, I know God. I'm not worried about anybody else. I mean, that's contrary to the entire Christian faith, right? 
I mean, we, we, that's the Great Commission. We're supposed to be telling people about Jesus, right? Not just our own kids, not just the next generation, but everybody. So this makes very clear, verse 4, one generation, praise your works to another, declare your mighty acts. So we're, we're testifying about God to the next generation. And that's important. And so uh, you feel like uh, even David may have not been fully of, aware of the long-term implications of what he's saying. Because if you think about what, when he's inspired to write this, when he's living, you know how far away the birth of Christ was from David? About a thousand years. So he's being inspired to write this stuff down. He doesn't know the extent of God's greatness other than what he's personally experienced. He doesn't know other than the Old Testament scriptures. He's not seen it fulfilled, the Messiah coming and being born and then going and living a perfect life and dying a sinner's death and rising up again on the third day. He, he's not been privileged to, to experience all that, right? So he's writing well in advance, but he still knows who God is because God doesn't change. God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So then, after he talks about passing it on, then in verse 5, the, on the glorious splendor of your majesty, on your wonderful works, I'm going to meditate. So that means, as, he's, as we're sharing with others, we're going we're gonna to ponder these things ourselves. We're going to think about, you ever had something really, maybe a major event in your life? Especially if you're a parent and the birth of a child. You ever remember like a, a day, two days, three days, a week, a month, right after that happens and, you're, and, and maybe you find yourself kind of sitting alone in the house just thinking, I can't believe that just happened. I, I, can't, I can't believe that I got a baby right here. I mean, you just keep kind of rehearsing it in your mind and just going back over the events and think, I can't. I cannot believe that just happened. I'm a parent. That's a miracle. And so if you think about David meditating on the mighty works of God, all God has done, and, and think about David and all that he's experienced in his life. He's got some things, he's got some memories, right, that he can think about. And so he's meditating on all that God has done. And then he closes out this first paragraph. Men shall speak of the power of your awesome acts. Tell of your, I will tell of your greatness. They shall eagerly utter the memory of your abundant goodness and will shout joyfully of your righteousness. So one after the other, David mentions all these adjectives, these descriptors about who God is. He is powerful. He's awesome. He's great. He's, uh, uh, he's got abundant goodness. He's righteous. So just in those two, three, two and a half verses, he's talking about the way we would describe God and how that should affect uh, our actions. In other words, it's not enough just to think it, but then it's to follow through with the reaction to it. What, what does that make you want to do after you realize who God is, and then the fact that you have a relationship with that God and he loves you and has, especially now, uh, on this side of the cross, uh, we're thinking about all that God's done for us in Christ, sent Jesus to die on the cross for me. I mean, that's a big deal. So we have a lot to talk about. So when you get to the next section, you talk about the compassionate God. It's kind of repeating uh, God's self-revelation, even back at Mount Sinai, almost word for word, and the, the glory of the Lord. You look at verse 8, the Lord is, here's more, more adjectives, the Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, which means he's patient, great in loving kindness, and then here it is again, he's good to all, not just to some, he's good to all. His mercies are over all his works. And because of that, what's the response? All your works will give thanks to you, and your godly ones will bless you, and they'll speak of the glory of your kingdom. So now we move from uh, redemption to, to um, 
rule, ruling. He's a king. So now you talk about his kingdom. This, this word kingdom is emphasized from verse 8 to verse 13 several, I think four different times. You see that God is uh, not just compassionate, not just kind and gracious and merciful, but he's mighty. He's the king. He's in charge. And so when you read these, these words here from verse 10 all the way down, they speak of the glory of your kingdom and talk of your power. Now you start to get the sense of, uh, the almighty nature of God. He's like, um, you could almost picture him sitting on the throne. And, and see, all of these different characteristics are just further building this big picture of answering this question. Why should I praise the Lord? Why does he deserve that? Every single one of these character traits are just giving us reason after reason after reason. We should be worshiping him. We should be praising Him. That's why David started out, I'm going to praise your name forever and ever. Every day I'm going to bless your name. So that, that's his response, and it, quite frankly, it should be ours as well. And so you see the power, the glory of His kingdom to make known to the sons of men your mighty acts, the glory of the majesty, here it is again, of your kingdom. And then look at verse 13. What kind of kingdom are we talking about here? Everlasting, never-ending. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. And his dominion endures throughout all generations. So that means that he's not just... You, you read the Old Testament, especially the book of First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles. And wh what do you read time after time after time? Well, this, he became king at this age and he reigned for 27 years. Then he died. Then he became king and he reigned for 34 years. Then he died. And then guess what? First of all, he's not dying, except for the time when he came back to life. And he's not ever not going to be king. It's everlasting. His, his kingdom is everlasting, and his dominion, or his authority, his power, is everlasting from one generation to another. So throughout all generations. So his kingdom will never end. His rule and authority will never end. That's because he is God of all creation. And, and that's, that's another reason. Praise the name of the Lord every day. Every day. He's worthy of being praised. He's king forever. And so what's interesting is uh, in these verses right here, the term all your works and then all you have made, it's the same Hebrew word, just said a couple different ways. And it basically just means everything. When he says uh, all your works... Uh, verse 9 and then verse 10, it says, His mercies are over all his works, and then all your works shall give thanks to you, all that you've made. And so there's nothing that's left out. There's nothing that's excluded from this uh, process of praise and worship. He is king forever. He's not just king forever. He's not just a redeemer. He's not just worthy to be praised. He's not just mighty. He's also the provider. And so look how this psalm comes to an end here from verse 14 down to verse 21. You notice at the beginning of each paragraph, for example, um, verse 3, the Lord is great. Verse 8, the Lord is gracious and merciful. Verse 14, the Lord sustains. Uh, there's always, uh, verse 17, the Lord is righteous there's always these major uh, characteristics presented at the beginning sentence of each paragraph. When we get to verse 14, you see this sense in which God provides for his children. The Lord sustains all who fall and raises up all who are bowed down. Uh, that speaks of not just humility, but discouragement. Those who are bowed down, maybe not just discouragement, maybe even shame or just you're, you're uh, in despair. In, any of those um, feelings that we may have in our lives, verse 14 addresses that. The Lord sustains all who fall and raises up all who are bowed down. So for whatever reason, you remember, um, gosh, I, I'm not going to. I'm not going to pick the right uh, psalm now. I'm, 
I don't want, well, I don't want to take too much time. It's in the Psalms. I have to look it up and give you the reference. Um, it's, there's, there's a choir, a beautiful choir song. The Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir sang it. Uh, but thou, O Lord, are a shield for me, uh, the lifter of my head. That's the, one of the lyrics in there. It's a beautiful song. And it comes straight out of the scriptures, out of the Psalms. So he, he lifts up or raises up all who are bowed down. So for, for whatever reason, for whatever reason has got you down, it's as if God himself will lift your head up and give you encouragement, especially when you need it most. And so because of that, it's almost like a sequence here, verse 15. The eyes of all look to you. You give them their food in due time. So he's providing He's providing uh, always on time. Verse 16, you open your hand, satisfy the desire of every living thing. So God is not a God that has all the resources but is very stingy and keeps his hands tightly gripped on all that he's created. He opens his hand. Here, let me give you what you need. What does the Lord's Prayer say? We've said this twice in the last week. Give us this day our daily bread. And, and, and what does the text here say? The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food in due time. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. So here, here's four aspects of life that testify to his concern, his constant care, his uh, dependability. His grace and kindness, um, and it starts in verse 14. Help for the inadequate. We mentioned all who, are, who fall, all who are bowed down. Verses 15 and 16, we just talked about food for all creatures. So now we're talking about the Creator's generous joy in His world. Verses 18 and 19, answers for those who pray. Well, that's how we start every Wednesday night. We talk about needs, we go to the Lord in prayer, we trust Him with everything, because we know he, He's got it under control, whether we understand that or not. So, verses 18 and 19 are talking about answers of prayer. Look, look at 18, the Lord is near to all who call upon Him, who call upon Him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of those who fear Him. He will also hear their cry and will save them. Just imagine... David's writing this, like I said, nearly a thousand years before Jesus was even born. And he's writing a verse that sounds exactly like you need to cry out to Jesus for salvation and he'll hear you and he will save. He uses that word, he will save them. So David is really not fully even aware of the extent of what he's writing, but he's still writing it down because that's what the Lord's telling him to write. And that's what was ultimately going to happen. So God is not just one who hears, but he's near. And he is that help that is ready and waiting. What, what did we just read? Was it just last week or the week before? God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. He's ever-present. He's always near. He's always right there ready to help. He, he never wanders off, and you gotta, you know, you got to holler and try to flag him down, and hey, I need you over here. No, he's, he's always there. He's always there. And so he, he answers those who uh, call out. He says he hears their cry and will save them. So then in verse 20, the last of the four aspects here, of protection for those who belong to him. And this verse right here, is the only direct mention in this whole psalm of the wicked. It's the only time it's mentioned in the whole psalm, right there in the second half of verse 20. Because he says, The Lord keeps all who love him, but all the wicked he'll destroy. So we're talking about God's faithfulness, his protection, his provision. He watches over those who belong to him. Did you know that nothing, nothing happened. There's, there's nothing in this category. Like, tell me something that has happened that God didn't know about. There's nothing on that list. 
Tell me something that happened in the world that was outside of God's control somehow. There's nothing in that category. There's, that's a blank piece of paper. And so anything that happens, we, we have to trust. And I, I'll give you another example. It's funny how all my examples come from me driving for some reason. There's a lot, lot to be learned from driving, uh, good and bad. All right, here, here's, a, here's one that's a, a perspective changer right here, okay? Because I'm always talking about I'm trying to get somewhere. I, I'll get behind every slow driver in Lexington County, right, all at the same time in the, on the same day. But, but here's, here's perspective for you, okay? Here's perspective. If I really believe that my God is almighty, and I do, if I believe that there's nothing that happens that he just didn't know about, and I, I believe that, that means that my perspective, when I get behind uh, Joe that wants to go 30 miles an hour in a 55-mile-an-hour road, you know, when I get behind him, bless his heart, instead of fighting off anger feelings, and impatience, maybe, I, maybe I, this thought ought to just at least cross my mind. Huh. I'm not as far down the road as I thought I would be. I wonder if there's a wreck up there somewhere that I just missed because God threw this, this fella in front of me to slow me down. And so now I'm not going to cross that intersection four miles ahead at the same time I would have, and maybe somebody's going to blow a stop sign, and I'm not going to be there. You know, who, who, know, who knows what I missed because God saw fit to slow me down when I was on my way and I was in a hurry and I was ready to get somewhere, but if I believe that God's almighty, then, then really, should I be mad? Well, No. For multiple reasons, I shouldn't be. But that's one. Who knows what I'm missing? That, that God's protecting me from something bad when I just thought, well, I'm upset because I'm not able to go the speed I want to go. You know? That, that's a perspective change. But it's one that, I confess, doesn't come to mind first off. You know? I'm thinking about... When's that next dotted line I can get around this joker? But, that, but that's, that may not be right. Maybe I ought to just pause for a second and say, thank you, Lord. I don't know what kind of nonsense you just protected me from, but I'm going to trust you, and, and I'm going to get to where I'm going whenever I need to get there, right? Because he, he cares for all those who belong to him. He watches over. So how does this psalm come to an end? After he says that, the Lord keeps all who love him, and the wicked he'll destroy. Verse 21, it's, a, it's almost like a bookend. You know, verses 1 and 2 was an opening, like a doxology, a praise. And then verse 21, my mouth will speak the praise of the Lord, and all flesh will bless his holy name forever and ever. It's not just David. It's everybody. Everybody needs to... Bless the name of the Lord forever and ever. So David says, I'm going to do that. My mouth is going to speak the praise of the Lord, but all flesh is going to bless his holy name. And that's because all flesh uh, should respond to God in that way. He's, he, is, he deserves for all his works. It's, it's another hymn. Uh, it's another hymn. I'll read it to you. I'll read it to you, and then I'll pray. And, and this is a song that everybody has sung if you've ever been to church in your life. It's the very first hymn in the book. Holy, holy, holy. Right? Uh, verse 4, second line. Well, I'll read the first line. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Now look at this. All thy works shall praise thy name in earth and sky and sea. All the works. Nothing's left out. That's because that's what he deserves. He's worthy of that. Right? And this psalm helps us to remember. 
So maybe go home tonight, just read those 21 verses. Read them over again. It won't take but a minute. Read them over again and just remember, man, God is real good, and he deserves our praise and worship. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for tonight. Thank you for your word, and thank you so much for an example to remind us how much you deserve uh, all praise and all honor and all glory, all worship from all your creation. So help us to do our part and help us to encourage others to do their part and to share the gospel along the way and to just uh, remind people what kind of God you are and why it is you're worthy of such praise. And so, Lord, we thank you for the goodness you've shown to us, and I pray that you'll help us to tell somebody about it. In Jesus' name, amen.